join us this evening. Um, I'm really excited. Tonight we have Captain Roy Taylor, who happens to be parked outside over here. He might get, he might get a chance to take a peek at his helicopter after the seminar here. But he's going to be talking all about electronic news gathering today. So, Roy. <coughs> Oh, my computer being bad. Cool. Let me take care of that. Yeah. Oh, Go ahead and deal with your computer while. Yes. Um, my name is Roy Taylor, as she said, and I have been flying for Channel 11 since 03. And I retired from the Baltimore County Police Department in 98, started WJZ's Channel 13's aviation unit or electronic news gathering from 98. 203. So I was with CBS for five years and I've been with NBC, BAL now ever since then. And it's almost like police flying, except you don't have the paperwork, which is really, really nice. You know, um, so my credentials are pretty much I have single engine commercial instrument airplane, I have multi engine and CFI in multi engine airplane. And I have ATP and helicopter, and I've got around uh, around 21,000 hours. So I've got a little bit of time flying. I mean, I pretty much fly every day. Is that just in helicopters, 21,000? Uh, close to 18,000 in helicopters. Wow. And the rest is in airplanes. So uh, you know, I haven't touched an airplane. Probably the last airplane I touched was here when I did the story with the... Uh, uh, LSAs. I think you should come touch another one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, about uh, several years ago, just prior to the state police uh, involved in that incident down in Andrews where they crashed, um, we did a training film. And this is something that myself and a friend of mine, Mac Finney, who's a photographer for BA, all put together to help teach other pilots what we do and how we do it. And it was to be done at a safety seminar at um, Howard County, which is where we use this video. And the reason being is that at that time, you had Howard County get in a helicopter, you had AA County with a helicopter, you had four news helicopters in the Washington DC area, you had three or four EMS operations starting to build up with their helicopters. And you had Baltimore City Police, Baltimore County Police, Hartford County Police, Department of Natural Resources, and not even going into the alphabet groups like FBI, CIA, DEA, they all have their toys. So can you run this here and we'll this will give you a little brief insight, and then we can get a little bit more into what's going on. But I think you'll find it kind of interesting. It's a little old, but uh, now go to just hit start. Yeah. Now the photographer on this is Bridget McGarry. He's in the back of BAL's helicopter while I'm flying. And those are the two Coast Guard helicopters that are based out of Reagan National Airport. Is it Reagan? Mm -hmm. uh, DCA. They are Blackjack 1 and Blackjack 2. Blackjack is their call sign. They have no um, rescue gear on board the aircraft. Those are the aircraft that come chase you down if you violate the SFRA or the FRZ. And this was an orientation flight for the second aircraft. Those are dolphins. Again, American Eurocopter, which is now Airbus. Went and did some formation time with the shots in the video. And we actually played with them for about 14, 15 minutes while they did some practicing of landing with shot time and all that. But you have to admit, it's kind of a neat shot. Taylor. I am the pilot reporter.
reporter for WBAL TV 11 News here in Baltimore. Now this video that you're about to see, well let's call it Electronic News Gathering 101. Our goal is to show you the pilot's duties and responsibilities, the photographer's duties and responsibilities, and how we both work as a team to accomplish our mission. Now in the state of Maryland, you have seven electronic news gathering helicopters. There's four in the Washington DC area, there's two in the Baltimore area, and there's one based in Salisbury. Now chances are, if you're responding to a major news event, one of us may already be at that scene. If not, rest assured, some of us are gonna be launching to go to that event. But how do we get dispatched? This is our newsroom here at WBAL-TV here in Baltimore. Now normally this is a very, very busy place, but what oversees the newsroom is the assignment desk. The assignment desk, well think of it as a command and control center. All the crews are dispatched from this location. The reporters, the photographers, and even our news helicopter. Now the assignment desk gets its detail from assignment meetings. They also can get information from tips that come in by telephone, and even the police scatters that they listen to. Hey Roy, can you check something out for us please? Now another way we're able to dispatch is we dispatch ourselves from information we receive on these scanners. This is known as EJ, short for electronic journalism. This is where all the microwave signals come in. Now they're able to track our helicopter by means of this computer anywhere we go in the state of Maryland. So all that being said, how do we do what we do? Well, come with us as we take a flight in Sky Team 11. Coming approach, helicopter Sky Team 11. Sky Team 11, coming approach, good. Checking in all parts stable. For the normal, no closer to 5, but that's blow. We're talking to Fox 13 on the other radio. Sky Team 11, just to see how close I'm at for the LA. Both off the meter, 2995. thanks. Up front, I have quite a bit of equipment that helps me do my job. For navigation, I have three GPSs on board. One is a primary, one is a backup, and on the right hand side, I've got one that shows me the actual streets that we're flying over top of. Below that, I have a monitor, which allows me to see what Mac is shooting, so I can position the aircraft so he gets the best shot. Now for traffic avoidance, I have an XRX. It will show me the closest three aircraft in proximity to my aircraft. For communication, I have two VHF radios for air traffic control and air to air. I have two transponders. I have three FM radios that allow me to communicate with the TV station. One's my primary, one in the back is for Mac. Then, last but not least, I have three police scanners. And that gives me the information that I need so I can make an accurate report. I'm Captain Roy Taylor and Sky Team 11. We have breaking news in Northwest Baltimore. A three-story garden apartment, Baltimore City, just now getting on the scene of this fire. From what we understand, there are at least three people trapped in this uh, dwelling that's on fire, the apartment complex that's on fire. Now that we've showed you some of the things that are up front, we're going to show you how we bring you those dramatic pictures. My name is Mac Finney. I'm the person behind the camera. I've been a cameraman at WBAL for 25 years and an aerial cameraman for 10. In the last five years, I've been exclusively assigned to Sky Team 11. Together with Roy Taylor, we've logged thousands of hours together, covered tens of thousands of stories, won numerous awards, and are probably one of the most experienced helicopter news teams in the country. Well, let me take you for a quick tour of my world, the backseat of Sky Team 11. Think of it as a flying TV control room. I'm able to listen to and record 12 different audio sources, including police, fire, air traffic control, and air to air. View four different video sources, beam a microwave signal back to multiple locations, switch between three different cameras, including one on the dash, one on the tail, and they all report to those cameras. City fire crews, they're not wasting it any time. We just watch them pick up one individual, move them out the window down the ladder. They got a second one that they're trying to put on a small ladder coming out of the window and they have a third person there. And this is not an easy task, as you can see. Things can get really busy up here covering breaking news, but safety does come first. And that's why it's so important that I provide an extra pair of eyes for obstacles and other aircraft. 
while we are responding to a major news event, we are over one huge, we're always talking on 2302, air-to-air -air frequency. Yes, there's no requirement that we do so, but we do it all the time for safety. We tell other news helicopters, we tell law enforcement helicopters, we tell EMS helicopters where we're at, what we're doing, what's going on. What that was a fatal crash on 95 with the uh, tanker truck that went off. Right now we're the ramp around and crashed down on top of 95. With uh, all the helicopters that are up here, everybody's talking to everybody. Go down underneath of me, Mike. I got you inside. Trooper, we got you inside as well. Now, what you have just seen is just a small sample of what we deal with with electronic news gathering. But it changes daily because technology changes on a daily basis. So we have to be able to adapt. But one thing that doesn't change is our responsibilities as pilot and the crew. We need to fly safely. We need to communicate with one another. I can't emphasize that enough. It makes me feel better when somebody is talking to me, let me know where they're at, and I talk to them to tell them my position and what I'm doing. For the crew from Sky Team 11, I'm Captain Roy Taylor. Fly safe. That gives you a real quick synopsis of what we do on a daily basis. I mean, sometimes we'll go up and we'll have nothing. Other times we'll go up and we'll be busy for six hours. The riots. I sat in that helicopter for over eight hours at a clip uh, for the riots. And it was hot fueled. Never got a chance to get out. I uh, had to call in Mike Perry to back me up uh, and continue flying because I had just timed out. Uh, as far as the FARs go for Part 135, and I was beat. I mean, fatigue factor, if you're in a helicopter, it's like being two hours in an airplane. Fatigue factor, one hour in an airplane is equal to three hours in a car. So uh, it, it really takes your toll on you as far as, because you're sitting there to hover a lot of the time, just, just holding the aircraft in an out of ground effect hover. So the, going all the time, though, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're, you're busy. <clears throat> now, we had presented this at a safety meeting with Maryland State Police with the Dolphins, and I had explained to the commander at the time that the way things were going, somebody was going to die, and two ladies later, they ended up having Trooper 2 crash at Andrews. And that's when they went from the Dolphins now to the AW-139s, and they put two pilots in there. So uh, that's what you're dealing with now. There's only two news helicopters now in the DC area uh, because of financial reasons. You have Channel 4 and you have uh, LNS, which operates Channel 5, 7, 9, and 8. Uh, Western Maryland. Say again? Western Maryland. There's nothing up in Western Maryland other than us going out that way. You know, if Hagerstown needs something, you know, for NBC, it's not unusual for either four or us to go out that way and, and grab it. Uh, the cost is really prohibitive. I mean, extremely expensive to operate. Salisbury has a R44 now. They went from a Long Ranger to a Jet Ranger to an R-44, and they've got a nice little helicopter down there at uh, Salisbury, Channel 16. Um, DNR just got their helicopter back. Uh, their helicopter went from being with the Department of Natural Resources to Montgomery County. Montgomery County didn't have the funding to get it operational, and the Fed said either give it back or give it away. It went to Harford County. Harford County had it for a while until they changed administrations. They got rid of it. Uh, it now went back to DNR. So DNR now has a helicopter for their operation. Uh, AA County has a 407. Howard County has a 407. Um, what else? You had somebody here on the Eastern Shore that had an LSA that was doing some Sheriff's Department over here. Uh, Sheriff's Department has a driver plane. Yeah, is that what it is? Yes. Okay, so I know they had something over here that they're they're utilizing. They have one plane and they presented here a couple months back. Yeah. So um, between law enforcement and you just saw the Blackhawk that did the low flyby here. Um, 
our biggest problem is getting, quote, people flying this big heavy iron to learn how to communicate. They don't know how to talk. We've had almost a couple of mid-airs between the Army, um, people from the Pentagon. They're starting to get better, but for the most part, they're low time, they don't fly like we fly. Uh, they don't know how to fly and talk at the same time. And that's why we did something along this nature. And it's, it's a difficult process. I mean, I had the state police yesterday saying they were south of Annapolis heading to an accident scene that myself and Channel 13 were over top of. And I knew he had just launched from Martin State. And there's no way he was south of Annapolis. <clears throat> so you have inexperienced people that are not familiar with the area operating the aircraft and they're, they're taxi drivers. They, they just don't quite understand or they're not put out there as often enough to stay current to, to, to get that experience. And that's what we end up running into. Have any questions? What's your area? I mean, like if something happened in Richmond, you don't, they don't send you to... It's Florida. plausible. I have been sent... Um, when they had the sniper? Yes. Okay, I was sent... Down to Richmond. But there, there, there is a limit to where they would send you, right? No, they'll send me anywhere they want to send me. We have a recorder in the aircraft. We may not be able to send the signal back to the station, but there are other stations that we can send the signal to or we'll record it. So, I mean, there's, there's no limit. Well, I mean, they wouldn't send you to Florida or something. They sent me to New York. Really? That's a weird airspace up there, too. Yes. So, I mean, it's plausible, depending on what they've got going and what they want. Okay. You know, there, there's no limit to where they can send me. I mean, that's it. So uh, what's the problem with these? Uh, these are new pilots that are coming out that are not uh, actively... Experience. Not having enough experience. Experience. I mean, their military teaches pilots how to blow stuff up, <laughs> you know. And for the longest time, and she'll probably tell you, a lot of military pilots were afraid of air traffic control and they would fly around class bravo or class delta airspace so they wouldn't have to talk i had a pilot that came from the military when i was with the police department and commercially rated pilot flew cobras couldn't take me from martin state airport to bwi because he didn't want to or just didn't know he how? couldn't do it he literally couldn't do it because in their minds, they sit down and they plan their flights and they have all this other stuff and whatnot. And, you know, one guy works the radios while the other guy flies the aircraft. And I tried to explain to him, you know, you're in the police department. You're not in the military. I said, we could be flying over in Wilkins. And the next thing you know, you're doing a surveillance all the way up to Manhattan. You have to be able to shoot from the hip and be able to take and navigate the aircraft and communicate with the aircraft to be able to get up there. I um, guess you're in a pretty freewheeling environment and there's several helicopters all over one. Yes. Said, it, it's probably just Maryland State and, you, and the news gathering ones, right? You have yeah. Maryland State Police, like I said, Baltimore City Police, Baltimore County Police. Ooh, okay. You've got uh, Howard County, AA County. Okay. I mean, you've got a lot of police agencies. Then you have DEA has their own ship. Customs has their own ship. Uh, in fact, Customs has a a star and a S seventy six Sikorsky. Would they necessarily all be flying around in the same region at the same time? It can happen. Okay. It happened during the riots. Oh, okay. During the riots, we had Baltimore City had two helicopters up. Baltimore County had one helicopter up. Maryland State Police had two helicopters up. Um, FBI had their airplane up. Uh, Customs had their helicopter up because everybody wanted a piece of the action. Then you had three news helicopters that were there. Wow. You know. It's a lot. <laughs> you're all right. That's why so, I mean, so it's, it, it requires a lot of paying attention to what's going because on. That's the part yes, of sir. the flying wing. Sure, typical altitude that we're seeing. It depends. 500 feet, 800 feet. Normally, we're staying 1,000 and below is what our LOA calls for, letter of uh, agreement with uh, BWI. And because the airplanes come in and do their tours and stuff, they'll be at 1,000, 1,100 feet, 1,200 feet. The banner planes are flying at 1,200 feet. And we've got a bunch of them that we have to deal with for uh, 
the um, baseball game and Preakness. In Preakness, we'll have three or four banner airplanes up there. We'll have a blimp up there. We'll have city police helicopter up there. We'll have a flyby coming in from the military. We'll have the Army parachute team jumping out or Air Force parachute team jumping out. I mean, it, it gets gets busy. Yes? Do you find it's mainly the military trained? Say again? Do you find it's mainly the military trained pilots that have trouble communicating? Oh, yeah. Oh, no doubt. Oh, no doubt. I mean, they're, they're horrible. They are really horrible. And it's because they're not used to that type of environment. I would take a civilian pilot that's flying an R-22 who's <laughs> gone through, you think I'm kidding. I will take a civilian pilot to, that has learned to fly in controlled airspace over any military driver any day of the week. You figure as much money as the government spends on training those guys. But they look what they're training to do. They're trained to fly the aircraft and blow stuff up. <laughs> you know, and they do it very, very well. Yeah. But they're not allowed to think. Go you know, this way. you know, go this way. You're going to go this way. There's going to be three or four of you flying in formation. We're just now getting to the point where uh, some of the guys that flying out of Aberdeen are actually really starting to communicate. We're just now starting to get some of the muscle aircraft flying out of. Uh, uh, Andrews, Andrews to start talking because they'll come up and want to shoot some approaches at the uh, um, shock trauma you know but I've had a muscle helicopter come right dead at me over Fort McHenry you know and I'm dodging to trying to get away from them fortunately the aircraft I have now has ADSB in I don't have ADSB out yet but I have ADSB in we have a few non aviators here, so you probably have to explain things like there ADSB. You go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Automatic dependence. Surveillance. Sur Traffic and weather information. Yep. Traffic yeah. And well. weather information. But <laughs> it will. ADSB is like having a fish finder. It will show me aircraft that are, depending on how far I have my screen pulled out, um, up to 40 miles away. But. Um, I'm not care I don't care about that. I want the, the guy that's, you know, less than a half a mile away from me. Yeah. It'll show their altitude. It'll show the altitude. It'll show where they're at. It'll actually give me their identification number, of who it is. It'll either show me their call sign or it'll show me their end number, one of the two. I mean, I see American Airlines or Southwest Airlines all the time. Ident yeah. yeah, yeah, from their transponder. No, we're t helicopter the helicopter. It's just you're, we you're sit there. To each other saying this is when you heard yeah. on the uh, thing here talking on 2302, 123025 is the air to air frequency for helicopter. 12275 is the air to air frequency for airplane. Now, when they come into Baltimore or if you go up to Philadelphia, or if you go up to New York, everybody, all the helicopters are talking on 12302 and they communicate. This is where I'm at. This is which way I'm heading. This is where I'm at. This is my altitude. Uh, just kind of that out there we just broadcast it out there in the blind. If somebody's out there, they'll say, hey, I'm at such and such. If I'm lifting off at Martin State Airport, you know, Scott Team 11 is departing Martin State Airport westbound towards the Inner Harbor. But is there still a control tower that tells you when to take off? And, and well, Martin has a control tower, which has their class Delta airspace. But once you're outside their Delta airspace, then you're not in controlled airspace. But I mean, when you take off at a helicopter, you don't have somebody telling you when you can take off and when you Depends where you're at. Depends on the airspace. Like so here, PWI, they'll tell you when you can take off and out, where you're going right. to take her out. But here, not. Here, you don't. Okay. You just want to take and follow noise abatement procedures so you don't get the neighbors upset. Okay. Because I mean, the airports you're talking to control top. Place like right here, I can go out there with a plane that doesn't have a radio. Mm -hmm. and just go fly away. Oh, like That's what gets car, me you about your car. You have to do the same. Do you have to call someone? And say, I'm going to drive out of my driveway now. Yeah. No, same thing. Exactly. I mean, there's. So you don't have to okay. file a flight plan with the FAA just to do that to randomly. No. Nope. What's a flight plan for? What do you think a flight plan is for? Well, say so they they can track you. No. What is the purpose I of a flight plan? Purpose of the flight plan is to find out if you don't make it from point A to point B, they know where to look. That is the only purpose of a flight plan. And the media, they'll take and harp when the, what was it, the baseball player that crashed up in uh, New York in Manhattan with the airplane. Uh, well, he wasn't on a flight plan. Well, 
he didn't intend to crash either, but a flight plan <laughs> is like a float plan for, for a boat. You know, you file a float plan with the Coast Guard. You're leaving here, you're going to Ocean City, this is the route you're going to take. Uh, I should be there in 12 hours. If I'm not there, start looking for me. Uh, it's the same thing. That's the only reason for a v visual flight rules flight plan is to know where to look for you in case you don't make it. I have a flight plan that goes from March State Airport to BW uh, to uh, Reagan National Airport and back to March State, and it's all filed every hour on the air. Simply because the regulations state you have to have a flight plan on file to fly in the SFRA. What does they say about rain? This uh, this special uh, flight resi restricted zone. That's. 30-mile ring around Washington, D.C. Such a controlled space, in other words. Yeah, it's, you, you call that you it's not really controlled. It's one of those type of things where don't cross this line. If you do, we're going to come after you. If you don't have permission to cross the line, you know, once you get permission to cross the line, you can do whatever the heck you want. So what happens if there's an incident and, say, four news-gathering helicopters like yourself come in is there some sort of rule of the road who claims the lowest altitude or what? Kind of started? first come, first serve, and normally, depending on what the scenario is, sometimes I'll fly a little bit higher than the other guys because we have a better camera. You know, I don't need to be as low, but sometimes Potomac Tracon will keep us down because of landing 737s, you know, to stay clear of them so we don't take and mess them up because they have a traffic avoidance system on their airplane if we set it off, they have to do a missed approach right away. Don't pass go, don't collect $200. It's that if you set the, uh, their alarm system off and they don't have the proper verbiage that has gone through, that I've got them in sight, remaining visual separation, uh, they automatically have to abort the landing and do a go round. So what happened in LA a few years ago when those two news gathering helicopters crashed in Medea? What was the... You mean in Arizona? In Arizona? There's one in LA too, I think. Arizona, they, is, uh, two news uh, helicopters crashed. They, uh, one was an A star. I think they both were A stars. And one was a backup pilot. They were involved in a chase, a police chase of a stolen vehicle. And um, they're, they just screwed up. You know, one turned left, the other one turned right, one misunderstood where the other one was at. They didn't have any type of equipment on board to show where other aircraft is. And that's one of the big pushes right now. That's why we want, you know, ADSB on our machines so we can see where the other stuff is. Uh, and a lot of times when I'm involved in a pursuit, we had a pursuit, oh, about a month or so ago, went from Baltimore City down to BWI AA County, through AA County, back up into the city, and the guy ended up finally wrecking his car in the southwest district of Baltimore City. It was a kidnapping, which is why the police continued to pursue. Uh, but I actually took the lead with air traffic control, the city police helicopter, Foxtrot. He was at one altitude, I was at an altitude, and then Channel 13 was an altitude. And we were talking back and forth on 2302. We were doing our live broadcast and communicating with BWI Tower. BWI Tower actually shut down departures for about five minutes because we were right off the departure end of the runway while they were chasing this guy. Um, that's why being able to communicate is so important. And I, I, it's, it's just, you know, extremely important to be able to talk and fly at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Are they happy for an extra set of eyes? Or do oh, yeah. I've got like a great working relationship. I was a cop for 27 years. I started the Baltimore County Police Aviation Unit. I know the guys. And the pilot's happy that he doesn't have to talk to BWI Tower because now he can concentrate with his aerial observer and fly his mission to try and keep the vehicle in sight. And sometimes the observers that they have in the aircraft uh, they lose it. They lose the car. But in so fact, nice. they actually did lose the car. And it was one of those type of things where, you know, it's like, hey, Fox, you still got them? Because the way you're going and the way the car's going is two different ways. And it's like, yeah, we lost it. Where's it at? It's like, 
make a right turn down the street here. He's, he's parked in a parking lot. And then they were able to get back on top of him again. But when you're doing circles like this, a lot of times observers get a tendency to get disoriented. It's not an easy job. You know, with me, I've got so much power in that A-star, I just pull it up and stop, which is nice, really, really nice. Do you have to do flying special way so the cameras? A lot of times, yeah, I'll have to take and put the helicopter in a weird position so the camera can actually um, get the shot uh, because you're dealing with the sun. Sometimes you're dealing with trees, wires, uh, obstructions. Sometimes there's only a small little window for the camera to get the money shot, so to speak. Somebody in a trench being rescued, you know. Um, so it's tough. I'm sitting there looking outside, flying a monitor, you know, communicating air to air, communicating with ATC, communicating with the desk, then doing a live broadcast. So it gets busy. And if I'm in the middle of a broadcast and ATC starts talking to me, I'll stop the broadcast and communicate back with ATC. Last, I think on the, ch the chase that you did end up in Southwest, at one point I heard ATC break into uh -huh. in, in your part. Yeah. So you're so, the only one that does the broadcast. Is that right? Is that what I read? You're talking about pilot. talking on air? You're the only pilot. That I'm the pilot that. reporter, yes. You're the only one of all the other news. Uh, channel 11, I mean, Channel 13 has a pilot reporter. Um, the DC helicopters do not. I don't know if the kid from Salisbury is doing it. I think his camera person is actually the reporter. So I, I'm not too sure on that one. There's not many pilot reporters out there because it's a tough job. It's really, really like tough. You got enough to do without uh, I mean, it, it gets extremely busy. I mean, we've been all in between the runways over here at BWI, you know, reporting, dealing with ATC, dealing with traffic, dealing with other uh, helicopters. I mean, it's busy. It's very, very busy. But that's why you want the high time guy that has the knowledge, that is used to flying. And, you know, sometimes I get a little bit upset with the fact that you got guys flying big, heavy iron and can't talk. But then you have to realize that, well, they don't have the experience that I don't have, that I have. You know, I was fortunate. Uh, in flying helicopters, I was trained by ex-Vietnam guys. So I had excellent training. Uh, I was already a pilot flying airplanes. So I knew how to communicate with air traffic control. Uh, I wasn't concerned about flying in instrument flight rules because I had been flying IMC for a good while. Um, so that helped immensely. But in the early years of flying helicopter, I didn't get my flight instructor certificate in helicopter until I had, oh, about 1,500 hours of helicopter time. Where nowadays, you have young guys that go right from the commercial, get their CFI so that they can train and build their flight hours up so they can get a job, but they don't have the experience. So you've got kids that are training kids to learn how to fly, and they don't really have the background for what can happen. I mean, they're sharp on the regs, you know, and they're sharp on certain procedures, but there's other stuff out there that they just don't know because they haven't had it. Yes, sir? Do you have a way to get experience? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have IFR capability? The aircraft is equipped. If I could, if I had to get into it or if I inadvertently got into it, I can get out. I've got a uh, 796 in there. It's not certified, but I can do a VNAV approach to uh, Martin State Airport, which will bring me down to 400 feet. You know, I practice that a lot. You know, I'll take and do VNAV. I can do a VNAV approach to Pier 7. It's amazing what it'll, it'll bring it down to. But the rule of thumb is we're not really going to launch in that severe weather. Uh, if we can't see, there's no sense in going because we can't film it. Now, where you saw the video of the guy in the car with the water up around him, that happened up in Northeast Maryland. And what happened up there is that the weather was goofy like it was today over here on the Eastern Shore. Um, I had just gone to Summit, Delaware, topped off with fuel, came back because there was a lot of flooding that had been going on up there. They'd been hit hard by storms. And then they had a bunch of storms that just all of a sudden popped up around that whole area. And I ended up just parking the helicopter on an old A&P food store parking lot that was abandoned. I just landed. 
and sat there and waited it out. And I mean, it rained hard for a good 20, 30 minutes. And when I launched, um, I picked up on a scanner of a flash flood that happened on Pulaski Highway in Northeast, Maryland. And it's like, you know, get out of here. There's no water rescue. And sure there was. That poor guy was driving a Jeep Liberty with his wife. They were coming down Pulaski Highway. They got hit by a flash flood. And the water was right up to the bottom of the windowsills. And it took them off the road into a culvert. Uh, the fire department ended up rescuing them. Uh, they ended up being able to get an engine down Pulaski Highway. They took a ladder uh, from the engine. And the gentleman was able to pop open his rear window. And they crawled through the car and climbed up on the ladder and climbed up onto the uh, engine of the uh, fire truck. What altitude were you at when you took that shot? Because with the telephoto thing, it looked like you were only about 30 feet above the car. I was about uh, 400 feet. Wow. You know, the cameras that we have, just to give you an idea, especially the one that we have right now, the Cineflex, from Martin State Airport, we can shoot the Bay Bridge. And we can see cars going across the Bay Bridge. And we can see silhouette of the people in the cars going across the Bay Bridge. And that's 25 miles away. So, I mean, on a good, clear day, you'd be surprised what you could see. How much would that camera run at? Half a million dollars. Sorry, I asked. <laughs> Cineflex camera systems, half a million dollars. Were you able to film him crawling out the back of the Oh, uh, we did. Mm -hmm. We got the whole thing. And they had submitted it for an Emmy, and I got a nomination and I actually won an Emmy on that for, for breaking news. So what do you tell a, a, a new pilot how, how best to get experience? What's, what do they, what do you That's know? tough. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really tough because the jobs aren't out there like they used to be. I mean, once upon a time, if you got your commercial license, in helicopter, you could fly for somebody and do aerial photography. And there was a kid that was doing just that in a Bell Jet Ranger at BWI Airport, and he ended up crashing right on the tarmac at BWI, killed him and the photographer. And what happened was is that the photographer was putting him in a position that he shouldn't have been put into with that aircraft, but due to lack of experience, he didn't know any better. Uh, he was about 400 feet above the ground. He had the winds coming out of the south, southeast, anywhere between 18, 26 knots, and was changing direction on him. And he got into a scenario called lack of tail rotor effectiveness, and the helicopter started to spin. And since he was in a hover, he figured, well, hovering auto rotation, you roll the throttle off to stop the spin, which is true. Once you get rid of the power, the torque, the aircraft will stop spinning. But it'll also stop flying. And he stalled the rotor system out by pulling up on the collective. And once you stall the rotor system out, it is impossible to get that rotor back. You can't do it. I don't care if you had 10,000 feet underneath of you. Because of the angle of attack to the resultant relative wind, you can't get the rotor system back. So the blades come to a complete stop. When he hit the ground, uh, the blades flexed, touched the ground, but the one tail rotor blade scraped the ground a little bit. The other one never touched. So the blades were at a dead stop when he hit, and he was just a, a brick. But the impact was such that it just flattened the gear. Both of them were, you know, were killed, the photographer and the pilot. So it's tough to get proper experience nowadays. It, it really is. You have to, some of the kids go up to Temsco, which is up in Alaska, and they'll learn to fly up there doing tours. Um, some will do like Las Vegas tours. Uh, there's tours in Florida. I know in Orlando there's a bunch of tours going around Disney World. New York City. So, yeah, New York City's got a bunch of tours. So, it, it you know, anything else? It's so expensive to get. Oh, it's very expensive. It's, it's ludicrous. I mean, like you're talking, when I got my commercial add-on, it was $6,000. That, that was just and, an add-on. And that was an add-on. And that was in 
79, yeah. 80. Okay, and that was a lot, a lot of money. That's a lot of money back then. Yeah. Um, now, just to get a, I guess a private, you're probably talking what, 18, 20 grand? Yeah. To get a private helicopter ready? Yeah, and that's starting from scratch. Yeah, starting from scratch. That's why I tell people to get their private pilot's license in airplane and then transition over into helicopter. The only problem is emergency procedures that you go through in airplane, if you do the same procedures in the helicopter, it will kill you. And vice versa, if you do certain emergency procedures in a helicopter and try to do that in an airplane, it makes for a very bad day. So, anything else? Sir. Question: Given the altitude you're flying, have you experienced any issues with drones or anything? I'm about to ask the same question. Oh, I've I've seen Somebody's quite asking. a few drones. I've had I've had two incidences where drones were at my altitude. Okay. I have more problems though with kites than drones. Oh, really? I've had kites at 1,100 feet, 1,200 feet. <laughs> That's a lot of strength. That is a lot of strength. <laughs> so I haven't, you know, I really don't care too much about the drones because if I hit them, you know, it's not going to take me out. You know, I'll take him out. They won't take me out. But a kite, with the type of cord that they're using, eh, it can make things a little dicey. Mm. You know, but I've had a uh, kite. In fact, we had a guy flying. Uh, God, where did he, was he? He was over in uh, northeast Baltimore, not too far from the old Memorial Stadium, mm -hmm. flying a kite. And the kite topped at 1,100 feet, 1,150. And I had to finally get into a position to where I could see the uh, kite string coming down. And I was able to follow it down to where he was staying on the Hartford Road. And, you know, because the city police, they couldn't, you know, get in there. They don't have the power in their machine to do what I can do with mine. And um, I pretty much told him, hey, he's sitting at Hartford Road near, I forget the, the cross street it was, up around 25th Street or, uh, 28th Street, somewhere in that neighborhood, not too far from uh, 36, or 33rd rather, and uh, just south of Montebello. And they were able to send the uh, ground guys over there and get them to take the drone thing down. But uh, yeah, kites are actually more scary to me than the drones are. What about like the commercial drones? Are you hearing anything from the news organization thinking about using them? Uh, there are some that are thinking about it. My gut feeling is that you'll see Channel 2 get one. Especially since they just changed the regs. Those are going to be scarier. Those are pretty big. Well, I mean, you take a drone, throw it in the back of a car. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem that they run into is the licensed pilot portion of the 333 and so all that other, right you know. Um, I feel for the AMA guys. You know, there is a strip just north of BWI, about five and a half miles, that they've been flying there for years. Never caused a problem, never had a problem. You know, and I know they're there, and I'll pull up alongside where they don't fly and sit there and watch them. And they'll got these guys hovering airplanes like this. They put them on the prop and they do all sorts of neat stuff. It's really cool. There is one over at Martin State Airport, just to the north, northeast of Martin State Airport, within the Delta airspace, about three and a half miles away. Never have a problem with them. I had, uh, when I was in Thailand, yeah. We had an area set off where the guys built model airplanes, uh -huh. remote controlled airplanes. And they were down there flying one time. There was about five or six of them flying. We sent one of our B 66s mm -hmm. you know, on a mission. When they got down to that end, they flipped on their electronics countermeasures and all those planes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the technology that they have now, you can take off an RC airplane from here and on a box and program it, and you can fly it all the way down to Pax River and back. Do you see your job at all threatened by drones in the future? No. Nah. No, I don't. Uh, it actually makes my job easier because on some of the less than, it's very expensive to fire that machine up to go get a locator of a accident that happened two days ago, you know? bring out a drone in the back and let them go knock themselves out, I don't care. When you have a chase like we had, you can't do anything different than that with the helicopter. When you have the riots, you know, it's tough to, you know, especially to get close enough to be line of sight 
and put somebody there with a drone in the middle of a riot? I don't think so. You know, so I don't see it threatening, you know, our operation. But also they have a time limit, don't they, with their batteries? They can, yeah, uh, some of them will do a half hour. Yeah, you can do way more than a half hour. Yeah, but I'm just saying, yeah, but I'm just saying. So what, you, it takes you, what, five minutes to take and land it and swap out a battery and put another one in there? I've got a friend of mine that works for, uh, we work for Boeing for their UAV operation. He's probably one of the most uh, knowledgeable people that deals with regulations and UAV operations in the country. And uh, he was involved in it before UAVs became UAVs because they were doing stuff with it over in Afghanistan and, you know, Iraq. And they saw a market here for law enforcement, firefighting. Uh, they even have one that goes for the Amtrak. It'll actually follow the Amtrak line in front of an Amtrak train. So, I mean, that stays up there a good while. You know, and the size that they're talking is less than 50 pounds. 50 pound drone's pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Very, very big. So, are you on call? Oh, yes. I've got Mike Perry, he'll cover me on Saturday, and I cover Sunday, but I'm on pretty much on call after 6.30. The thing that they have to watch out for, if they pull the trigger and pull me in, from the time I'm off to the time I can come back is 10 hours, because I'm part 135. So they have to be very, very careful if they call me back in for something. What is part 135? Air taxi. It means I'm held to a higher standard than your average pilot. I have to do annual training every year uh, by the FAA or a designated FAA Czech Airman. Um, there is a limit on how much I can fly a year. There is a limit on how much I can work. I can do a 14-hour duty day and a maximum eight-hour flying day. And whichever comes first, if I fly for eight hours in, in a 24-hour period, I've, I've turned into a turkey. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm done. How does the FAA conclude you're an air taxi? Say again? How does the FAA conclude that you're an air taxi? Because I am an employee of U.S. Helicopters, and the photographer is an employee of WBAL. So if I go from here to Ocean City and I land, I've just transported an individual for compensation to hire to Ocean City. Even though if we were doing aerial photography, that's fine, but once we land and we do stuff on the ground, because I'm also a reporter, we can go do packages on the ground. So we go down there, we shoot a package uh, for the five o'clock show or six, six o'clock show. Um, I've transported a passenger for compensation or hire. You know. So your helicopter is not owned by the station? It's no, it's owned by U.S. Helicopters. I'm actually a U.S. Helicopter employee but my, sta my salary is paid by the station. It's a numbers game. <laughs> you know, it's one of those type of things where it also deals with liability. But you know, the copter, right? <laughs> if I screw up, they go after U.S. helicopters. They can't go after WBAL. So, like I said, I'm held to a higher standard than your average Part 91 pilot. Part 91, you can do whatever the heck you want to do for, for the most part. Any other questions? You guys want to see the aircraft? Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's go take a look at the helicopter. And everyone the Chesapeake Sport Pilot is hosting monthly aviation seminars at the Bay Bridge Airport in Stevensville, Maryland. All seminars are free and not only open to the public, but designed for the public. The seminars are held at 7 p.m. in the Pilot's Lounge which is the small white building at the Bay Bridge Airport. Videos of all previous seminars can be found online by searching QAC TV, YouTube, Aviation. Upcoming seminars on the schedule include Del Marva's Seaplanes, Hot Air Ballooning, and Are Those Little Planes Safe? For more information about all the aviation seminars, go online to www.airportprograms.com. We hope you will come out and enjoy your airport with us for a fun and educational evening.